Hi, I'm Emily Baker. My name is Michael Ramirez. My name is Edmund Tavis. My name is Gordana Herning. We are going to present double curve spin valence, geometric and computational basis. So the goal of the paper is to describe the method that we used to translate the spin valence system into a computational controllable system that would be able to take double curved surfaces as an input target surface and work in the same way that it does when it's in flat or single curved configurations. So first I wanna describe what is spin valence. Here is an installation that was done at Cranbrook Art Museum quite a while ago. This was work that I produced inventing the system, which is a kirigami based space frame system. So cutting and folding sheet material, in this case steel, into a deployable space frame that is essentially made of a single part folded and reconnected to itself rather than a series of discrete parts. And the system has been explored and used in a number of scales, a variety of tiling patterns. At its core, the system is very simple. As you can see here, uh, any number of polygons might be translated into a single unit of spin valence by arraying a series of roughly L-shaped legs around each side of the polygon and then pinching the corners in order to create this kind of strategic weakening of the material where, where it's desirable for it to bend. And this will allow a kind of spin fold of a centralized hub out of what was the original surface. Individual units can deploy from a flat cut sheet and they have a chirality to them, as you kind of see in these mock-ups. So here, a diagram of the cut pattern as it's generally used in steel. And then this is a kind of abstraction that we started to use in order to draw these systems more easily in the computational space, reducing the central hub to a simple quadrilateral, the legs to lines and the base surface to another quadrilateral shape. And you can see that the rotation of the unit hub, which we call this central area, is uh, correlated to the height of the deployment. Here's an animation that shows the deployment space. In this case, this is a parallel deployment space. And we'll see later in the paper the way that we've moved away from solely parallel deployments. When units start to come together and have a relationship side to side, a important kind of triangulation starts to occur which is what allows for the system to start to become a space frame. So the relationship of both what we call the primary and the secondary surface tilings, both are important and have their own set of constraints. And you can see here the building up of a, a tiling pattern in the square flat deployed version, this rotational Pythagorean tiling that we see animated over in the corner. The primary surface is the original sheet of material that's then cut, and then as that cut surface deploys out, the hubs reconnect to each other and create this secondary surface. One surface ends up being two interconnected surfaces creating the space frame. And for the purposes of this paper, we're using the color coding of red being the secondary surface, blue being the primary surface. And here's an example of a larger sheet of steel being folded in a series of steps. It's low waste and extremely quick to put together a space frame in which both the geometry and deployability of a single unit is encoded within those cut lines, as well as the geometry of the overall aggregation. It's a system that was very much developed from the beginning to be a hands-on process that is tuned to be fabricated by hand easily. And while spin valence has been explored as a system that can bend and curve in a single direction, those zero Gaussian curvature types of aggregations. The purpose of this paper is to now explore the double curve. And I will throw it over to Edmund Harris. Thank you, Emily. Working with spin valence to create doubly curved surfaces means we have to deal with two issues, both of which can be described in mathematical terms. We have to deal with the distortion of the surface itself. Mathematically, this is described as Gaussian curvature. And then we have to deal with how that surface is placed into three-dimensional space. 
To illustrate this, we can think about a piece of paper. This has Gaussian curvature zero and can bend quite freely in one direction. But if we want to bend in one direction and then in another, the whole thing is going to crinkle. We create a situation where the geometry of the surface can't adapt to what is happening as the surface gets placed into space. In contrast, if I look at this thicker piece of card, while it will bend somewhat, if I try and bend it too much, it again starts to crease and fail. The first problem is the problem of Gaussian curvature. We, are, we can bend in one direction, that doesn't change the geometry of the piece of paper, but when we try and bend in a different direction, we're actually forced to change that geometry, and so the paper resents this and distorts. For the thicker material, even that first bend changes the geometry of the layers of material, so we have to take into account the thickness. When we move from a sheet of material to the space frame, the shape of the individual units has to respond to the Gaussian curvature and enable that to work. The thickness of the sheet becomes the depth of the space frame, rather than any consideration of the material used to make it. In the case of spin valence, this is the relationship between the primary and the secondary surface. These considerations are already encountered in superficially similar systems, like doubly curved tensegrity grids. In the case of spin valence, however, the relationship between these two surfaces is even more restricted. As each unit is cut from a single flat sheet, we must create compatible tilings of the primary and secondary surface, and in addition, as the individual units deploy out from the primary surface, they must link up again to form the secondary surface. As the deployment is not a completely free action, but height and rotation all relate to each other, this creates a very constrained system. All these choices are created at the time the units are cut, so the units must be modeled before the cutting can take place. In order to achieve this, we set up a two-stage process. Starting from an input surface, we first find a good tiling of this surface that will work for the secondary surface, that is the more constrained of the two. Then, from this secondary surface, which approximates our target surface, we deploy the units back to create an optimal primary surface. In order to do this, we had to identify a good candidate for the secondary surface, solve the geometry of the individual units, and finally do an optimization to create the fully optimized units. Michael will describe this process in more detail. Thank you, Edmund. We're starting with the original input surface and we would create the secondary surface by using a quad mesh function in Grasshopper. To represent the twisting and deployment of each unit, each quad is rotated and scaled within its own plane from this configuration to create a more cohesive secondary surface Kangaroo is used to apply more constraints onto the system. This would influence the vertices to be more conical and also properly connect at their vertices to become a checkerboard-like pattern, which is seen in the improper construction. There are also constraints to make each unit relatively have the same side lengths and for the tiles to remain along the boundary conditions of the pavilion. The secondary surface geometry is used as a starting point for creating the primary surface where the primary surface would deploy from the secondary. This is done by first solving the geometry of a single unit, as shown in this video, then performing optimization to create a cohesive primary surface by minimizing the distances between deployed primary surface tiles, as shown in blue. The goal for solving a single unit is to define the motion for deployment using easily manipulatable parameters. These parameters are found through the constraints of the unique spin valence Kirigami system. In Kirigami, no additional material can be created, so the primary and secondary surfaces are treated as equivalent sizes. Their connecting legs, as shown here, are to be the same lengths as these adjacent sides all across the hub. Also, to simplify calculations, rhombuses are used for the primary and secondary surface due to their symmetry. The spin valence system is a two parameter configuration space with parameters being named theta and phi. 
Manipulating the variables will dictate the centroid distance vector, p, between surfaces, and also add a deployment rotation. Generally, the theta elevates the unit in the positive z direction, and phi adds to the degree of non-parallelism, which is necessary for creating doubly curved surfaces. This phi causes a rotation about either the primary or secondary axes of the rhombuses, which can be changed with R1 and R2. Here is a more organized view of the projected design space for theta and phi. To create the primary surface, Python SciPy optimization library is used. Starting from the secondary surface geometry from Kangaroo, the Python script receives and translates this data. Here's what it looks like in Matplotlib. Then the algorithm loops through all of the units and globally deploys their respective primary surfaces using a pre-assigned theta and phi. Here's what it looks like when the surface is not optimized. Next, an expansion factor is used on deployed units to more accurately account for the leg widths in actual construction. The objective value for this optimization is the total summation of distances between adjacent deployed units, as shown earlier. This is found through an algorithm that locates adjacent sites and calculates the smallest distance between them, as shown in black. For optimization, the sequential least squares algorithm in SciPy's optimization library is used. This manipulates the theta and phi's for all units across the quad mesh to create a cohesive primary surface, which then can be exported for structural analysis into Rhino. Thank you. Hello, I'm excited to share with you some of our conclusions. So this method enabled the first physical mockups of double curved frames we see here in chipboard and steel, although the method is being developed in order to better enable fabrication of the outputs. And for that, an additional problem must be solved. The abstracted units used in this computational method do not yet account for an offset between the point at the vertices of each polygon and the point of pivot within the usable cut pattern of the unit for fabrication. While this may seem like a simple offset, it significantly complicates the mathematical underpinnings. Our prior analyses included experimental testing in parallel with computational modeling currently for double curved frame in order to structurally characterize the system. And in our tests, displacement control loading was distributed through a plate to four central nodes on either the secondary or the primary surface that we see in the images on the left and right. And we saw essentially equal ultimate load capacity for the two orientations. And when the secondary surface faced down, there was non-ductile cracking in some welds, which is seen on the solid curve on the plot as slight reductions in capacity before the load was redistributed in the frame. And the numerical simulations captured the structural action we saw in the tests. And here we see that many other tiling patterns may be employed and some target surface forms may actually lend themselves to better geometric and structural optimization. The hub and tiling geometry show us how the cuts and holes give Kirigami the ability to significantly change the shape. And so a future parametric study could focus on this relationship between geometry and strength. The tiling patterns and their density are one aspect, but the cut patterns also determine element width and joint geometry or rigidity. So what are the optimal ways to distribute the material? Now to quantify weight efficiency of various configurations, we can relate load capacity and material use. In other words, how much of the superimposed load relative to its self-weight can a particular configuration support? Span to height ratio, curvature, single or double and support conditions are important. And we should also consider trade-offs in constructing frames with different number of elements joined at the nodes. Another aspect to explore further is this relationship between the primary and secondary surfaces. And on the left, for general forms, the secondary surface, which is drawn as a dashed line here, could pass through the primary and allow continuous forms with peaks, where the secondary surface is below the primary and the valleys, where the secondary is above the primary. And finally, here, these images show why other tilings could also be beneficial and how an augmented reality platform such as Fologram could allow for precise deployment of units by projecting three-dimensional data into the physical fabrication space and 
notifying the fabricator when the part is within tolerances for the design. Thank you.